Where do we start? Do we start with Engeron's gag order being lifted by or being stayed by an appellate judge in New York who said, we have some First Amendment uh, violation concerns in this? I don't know. Apparently, uh, Engeron has issued four orders that have been overturned by a higher court in New York, but I couldn't name all of them with the exception of the gag order. I don't know if you know offhand what other orders Engeron had issued that have been overturned. Well, it shows up in the mis uh, the mistrial motion, one of them, which was he was delaying ruling on the summary judgment motions until the eve of trial, which basically ambushed the Trump team into not knowing what to prepare for trial for until the appe appeals court finally ordered him to issue an, an, an opinion uh, uh, before trial. So, you know, he, he's been game playing the entire time in ways that have been adverse to the Trump team, even when he's been overturned on appeal. He also tried to immediately disband the Trump organization, which would have led to mass unemployment uh, in, in, for the Trump employees. And that the Court of Appeals also stepped in and overturned uh, and invalidated. So when they I mean, to the, uh, the Court of Appeals, I think, could have done more. This is a case that I think should have been shut down by the federal courts for selective prosecution, should have been shut down by the Courts of Appeals for being a baseless case from the inception. But uh, they have sporadically and belatedly got in. But when they have, they've usually corrected his rulings that have been to the extreme. And the, their motion for mistrial reveals the scale and scope of the problems. But here again, once any of, uh, judge looked at the, the grounds he overturned the gag order was precisely the grounds we discussed, where a lot of legal scholars and so-called legal analysts didn't even comment on which is there is no right of judges to prevent criticism of them or their staff. There, that, that has never been a basis of prior restraint. The only permissible basis of prior restraint has been uh, certain kinds of national security information. And even then, as the New York Times case, the Pentagon Papers rem uh, should remind everybody, even then, that usually that isn't even grounds. Otherwise, it's just immediate impact of the jury. In other words, to make, let's say you had excluded evidence as a judge and the prosecutor, as the jury was walking in, screamed what it was, right? That's what you could claim as a gag order to prohibit that degree of influence, illicit influence on a jury. That is literally it. And there's no other grounds. And this judge is just doing whatever he wanted, as he's done throughout the case, no matter how many times he gets reprimanded by the appeals courts, no matter how many times he gets criticized. So, uh, so it's not surprised that the gag order was overturned. Uh, enjoined, that the fines are probably going to be set aside, that gag order will be further evidence and already was at, uh, evidence introduced in their, their motion for mistrial, which there were things in the motion for mistrial that I, I even didn't know had happened. Uh, now, uh, the, I, I'll go over some of them because the extent of the Allison Greenfield relationship, I never, like, it's funny that a, a visual really puts things in a different perspective, but seeing her on the bench with Engeron, it's just sitting next on, I think it's on his right, like, like two uh, Stalin-esque decision makers, it really put into perspective what they're complaining about in terms of constant back and forth of notes. Uh, what's her name? Alison Greenfield. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on Greenfield. You'll get the other ones that I miss. Donating in 2022 over the legal limit contributions to political activist organizations, including uh, Leticia James. I think it was either her... Uh, re-election or something to do with actually endorsing, supporting Leticia James, who's persecuting Donald Trump. Um, and she, campaigned on that. Cam and, and campaigned on prosecuting, persecuting Trump. Um, what, I mean, the, 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 the behavior of Engron towards the Trump defense team, accusing, I forget his name, uh, Kais of, um, of, of misogyny, because he's commenting on uh, Allison Greenfield sliding notes back and forth with the judge, seemingly directing this entire trial. Oh yeah, she also uh, chummy chummy with Chuck Schumer. That mistrial motion, if you didn't know what was going on, you wouldn't believe it was true. Which ones am I missing, Robert, that you want to highlight for us? The one that I didn't know about is that the judge himself has been bragging in his newsletter oh. to the school about his actions in this case. And I mean, and, and you know, the that's patently inappropriate, uh, unethical, unprofessional conduct. That goes beyond just the obvious partisan bias we can all witness, but there's certain basic prophylactic rules that exist. A judge can't comment on a case outside of the courtroom. 
he's been doing that repeatedly. So not only they catch his wife sharing memes and a whole bunch of things about the case, hostile to Trump on social media, so it's a member of his family, but he himself has been doing this. So it's not only when he's not showing photos of his abs, he's busy showing photo memes and articles about how he's screwing Trump and bragging mm-hmm. about it. She campaigned on this. She, she referred to it indirectly as the real estate case. But when she was campaigning for a judgeship herself, was talking about how she's the co-judge in the case, how they're out to get him, how her objective is to be a partisan judge. I mean, these are extraordinarily shocking things to be explicitly and expressly stated. Uh, I don't think this case, this judge is so insane. I don't think this case has any chance of being affirmed, even from a corrupt, partisan, Democratic New York higher court system, because it's so embarrassing and so humiliating to the judiciary of New York. Uh, actually, good, good, good mention. I had talked about the anger on in his Wheatley alumni paper. You know, in addition to the nudie pic, which is inappropriate but not judicially corrupt, posting links to how he's screwing Eric Trump, the decisions he's made, and that's right. Uh, what's her face having run for a judgeship and lost and calling herself the co-judge? It's it's and saying that her goal is the partisan goal of her constituents. Said, I'm not here to make precedent on law. I'm here to make precedent based on the goal, partisan objectives of my constituents. I mean, this is overt, open, blatant. Well, we can all witness, but most corrupt judges are smart enough not to tell the world how corrupt and partisan they are. These two nitwits can't do that. It's shocking. So the the uh, a higher level judge, the higher level one judge from the court of appeal, lifted the gag order. Said uh, this isn't a criminal trial. There's no jury in here to intimidate. Um, I got First Amendment rights uh, concerns lifted. We'll see what that does. Uh, is there? There's nothing else coming out of the New York case that I know of. Um, they they had no, the other one this week. Is, I mean, you get a sense for. I think part of this is Robert Kennedy's campaign and some other factors. But you know how insane the legal arguments are against Trump when liberal Democratic judges or judges in liberal Democratic states like uh, or anti-Trump Republicans like those in New Hampshire, like those in Michigan, like those now even in Colorado, say that Trump cannot be removed from the ballot. And interestingly, the Colorado judge made the exact argument I made that certain legal scholars are up. Oh, that doesn't apply. You can't make that argument. That's crazy. And even the liberal Democratic Trump hating, donating to Trump opponent organizations said exactly the same thing, said it's quite clear the 14th Amendment doesn't even apply to the president of the United States, couldn't even apply to ballot access for the president. Even the even a near commie is admitting this truth. (laughs) So, I mean, at this point, you know, the argument is open and shut. And I think their ballot and especially the constant threat of Robert Kennedy absorbing those votes anyway but it, I think is a reinforcing factor behind these liberal Democratic judges being a little less eager to get Trump off the ballot. But, but, but legally, this is the common sense conclusion that can be reached. Now, but L- Lawrence Tribe was the one who had been promoting this idea as a legitimate and actually... And that political hack that Mike Pence relied upon for his bogus <laughs> January 6th impression, who was that right-wing nut job that a bunch of Federal Society people wanted to put on the Supreme Court until his decision that you could lock up and kill Americans uh, without any constitutional due process was seen as maybe a little too far. So I, I'm picking on Lawrence Tribe because he's a Harvard graduate. I believe he's a Harvard professor, legal mind. He was the one who, from the beginning, I don't think he believes it uh, as far as he can throw my beautiful fossilized turtle shell, but promoting the idea that it's a legitimate and really a, a legal theory to be reckoned with. And it's, it's out the window now. Now that his initial assessment and legal opinion has been uh, thoroughly humiliated, he's got a pivot and he says, oh, it was, a, it was a Trump victory, but it might be a loss because the judge in that decision came to all sorts of other findings of fact that they'll be able to use against either him or others. Robert, how the hell does a civil judge come to a conclusion in a civil proceeding of insurrection? I mean, is that not a oh, yeah. criminal act? I mean, I just consider that all nuts. Uh, and irrelevant, and because the you know she wanted to take her shots at Trump, uh, fine, take your shots at Trump. It has no meaningful bearing. No, it, it, no meaning. I mean, there was no discovery in the process. It was a shortened proceeding. It was a primarily a legal matter. So her conclusions aren't worth the paper they're printed on in terms of the factual claims that she made. There's no collateral estoppel or anything else there. There was no meaningful 
due process to adjudicate that part of the process. So the uh, so it, it has no bearing uh, on her her nutty conclusions. The but well, the fact that someone that nuts acknowledges and admits there's no constitutional basis to deny ballot access by a state official for if for Trump uh, should uh, should tell everybody on that you know ballot denial side that they have a huge very uphill battle. They always did. The question was, would their political predicate, political basis? Uh, you know, override that. Um, the uh, it doesn't set precedent. There's no factual precedent from what the Colorado judge said about anything factually. And now the, the- uh, it, it's not precedent even legally. It's just legally it establishes the it, it's even left wing Trump hating judges as re- re- reflected in the rest of the order proceeding are having to admit that they can't keep them off the ballot. What I just, I mean, illegally non binding, it's just the fact pattern as per this judge in that case. It will allow the media to run with the narrative. It'll allow the media to now oh, shift sure, and say, yeah. Judge but found they were already running with that narrative. Yeah, so. but, but in, in, no one has even been charged with insurrection. They were charged with, oh, at sure. worst, seditious conspiracy. So yep. they're going to appeal it. Um, I, I presume no, the no, there's no reason for Trump to appeal it. And my guess is the Republicans that try to keep Trump off the ballot probably won't appeal it. So the, uh, I mean, maybe they'll try, but it's highly unlikely. Highly, un- you know, the uh, uh, they're not going to get any higher court to overturn. They're not going to get a higher court to step in and try to keep Trump off the ballot. You know, that that's again, if you can't win in front of a liberal Democratic judge, and some of the Michigan judges had different political backgrounds depending on which ones, but several different ones came to the same conclusion. Yeah, and and I put up a, a Supreme Court brief I filed years ago. There's a long history of this. And the courts constantly come on, come in on the side of ballot inclusion, not ballot exclusion. They, I mean, they know what the ballot's really there for. It's for voter choice. And anything that tries to restrict the ballot is something they've generally been, they've disfavored. Now, if it involves really minor third party or independent candidates, they'll, they might screw them at the lower levels, but the higher levels have ultimately stepped in. And that's because they know that if the ballot doesn't remain free, people's perceptions of America's uh, how democratic it is will be severely impaired around the world. That's where I thought, you know, I've said all along that I didn't think courts would go this far. I mean, it was becoming increasingly concerned of the risk of it for to the degree that I think uh, Robert Kennedy's campaign provided some deterrence from Democrats doing it. But putting that aside, constitutionally, there's no basis for it, but also just public policy wise. It, it, it's how suicidal are the courts? Right. And we're seeing that in the New York case. Are the New York Court of Appeals willing to be suicidal so far? No, they're not as, as suicidal as, as the trial court judge wants to be. They're not willing to go down, go down with him. And as much as they want to get Trump, uh, the the these tactics and are backfiring on them in the court of public opinion to such a degree that the judiciary itself is at risk. And historically, the judiciary isn't willing to commit political suicide. We'll see. I mean, maybe they will in the end. Maybe they'll let Trump get locked up. Maybe they won't overturn any of these cases. Maybe they'll let him be excluded from the ballot. But I think these cases are increasingly showing the same pattern. Even Trump hating judges and secretaries of state are saying, no, this is a, a bridge too far. Now, the, the finding in Colorado, which says ultimately that the 14th Amendment doesn't even apply to the president. Yeah. Uh, people were raising the argument that this is a victory for the um, primaries, but not for the general. Does that argument not apply yeah. to Tadis Mutantis? Yeah, the of general? course it would apply to the general. Okay. So basically this is, despite Lawrence Tribe, uh, et al. trying to save face because their legal opinions are, are becoming increasingly... Yeah, I mean, the Minnesota opinion. Supreme Court, Democratic Court, these are all Democratic, for the most part, Democratic states or Democratic courts saying, no, you can't do this. And if you, I mean, I've been doing this area of law for a quarter century. If you knew this area of law, you would know how utterly unprecedented what they were asking was. And so my initial reaction was no chance. And then you saw these political hacks willing to cross every Rubicon known to man. And you're like, well, maybe. Uh, but the fact that they've lost all of these. Now, again, I think practically uh, uh, that some aspect of this is being influenced by Robert Kennedy's presence on the ballot in these states coming up. The I think that has a little something to do with it, given the survey showing the kind of support he has that basically they risked losing Minnesota and Colorado, New Hampshire, if they took Trump off with Kennedy on uh, Biden would lose it to Kennedy. And all of a sudden they're in the same, they're in a worse boat than they were with beforehand. 
So the because those are three states they should Biden should win one by close to double digits or better in 2020. Uh, the fact that it was those states not willing to remove Trump from the ballot means this is almost already DOA. You know, you've you've now had, including some other cases have been brought where it was jurisprudential grounds it was dismissed. I think eight or nine cases or election elected officials who've rejected the request to remove Trump from the ballot. Uh, what you're going to, especially they all can read polls, right? I mean, there is no election official that really is eager to commit political suicide, however much they hate Trump. The uh, I, and if you go back, that goes back to Wallace's campaign, Perot's campaign, Anderson's campaign, socialist people's campaign. You know, they got away with it some against Nader, but ultimately the court stepped in and later, after the fact, uh, remedied it and said, actually, this shouldn't have happened. Nader should have been on the ballot. They, they don't like looking like they're manipulating democracy, even when they want to manipulate democracy. And when it's so open, so overt, so blunt, so blatant, that's when it gets too far. And I think this judge knew that uh, if she had denied Trump ballot access, she would have got overturned on everything and then would just look bad in retrospect. So the uh, that that's where I think uh, I, that's the probable trend to continue, uh, especially with Robert Kennedy being a likely independent candidate on all the ballots. I mean, he is already declared as such. And the uh, uh, and he, he may have to fight to get on the ballot in some states because of all the crazy laws and crazy rules they try to set up to rig the game. But uh, his continued presence will be a continued deterrent to Democrats eager to, to, to try to kick Trump off the ballot. I mean, even California, which initially was talking about it, suddenly has gone quiet about it. Um, so the I, I think part 80 percent of this is just this is what the law is so overwhelmingly on. Uh, and is, and judges don't like to commit pure political suicide, take risk. Yes. Political suicide. No. Um, look to the conservatives during the New Deal era. We'll talk about some of the cases they issued then. But, you know, they were they're ready to undo most of the administrative state from the get go until all of a sudden it, there was such a public blowback. They're like, well, now that we think about it, the administrative state's just fine. Uh, you know, I mean, they reversed themselves in mass in, uh, in within a year. Um Judges are not politically tone deaf. That's why the court of public opinion ultimately doesn't always reach them as it should, but usually reaches them when you need it the most. Uh, one last question before we head over to Rumble, people. I'll put the link in the chat now, but it's it's the pinned comment. So New York gag order getting overturned or stayed on appeal. Uh, the motion for mistrial was dismissed. Heard by anger on dismissed. That's going to be appealed. Oh, it's all well. without merit. It's all without merit. <laughs> He had no meaningful substantive response to many of those things. He didn't deny that factually most of them were true. Um, he just, you know, just pretended it somehow didn't mean anything, didn't have any consequence. It, he's setting himself up to just get easily overturned. He thought he would be a hero, and instead he's becoming a villain. And that would, he just doesn't under, he lives in such a bubble. He didn't understand that the abuse of power that these judges are used to with, with uh, less famous client, less famous defendants can't do against Trump. I mean, that, that's the scale that all of these judges and prosecutors and state elected officials and others have misgaged that, you know, they are like, hey, I got away with it for years. That, you know, the prosecutors like James and other contexts got away with it for years. And all of a sudden it's backfiring on them. I mean, it's like the prosecutors in Kenosha didn't expect the Kyle Rittenhouse case to backfire on them. They thought they'd become heroes, not villains because because they don't understand the court of public opinion on some of these cases, but also, I mean, similar to the you know the efforts of the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture in harassing uh, uh, Amos Miller, which, by the way, you can go to uh, a pinned tweet, a pinned comment at vivabarneslaw.locals.com, doing a special fundraiser for uh, uh, Amos Miller for Free America Law Center, supporting his cause. You can get yourself some apple butter just in time for the holidays, homemade by the Amish farmer Amos Miller. But you know, the part of the public backing him. Uh, it was a key reason why we've been able to get him to a place where, you know, he's allowed to sell still not as broad as we want it to be, but at least he's allowed to sell some meat, allowed to sell some operations. His farm didn't close. They didn't seize it. But all that happened because all of a sudden there all the public stories weren't all bashing him. Uh, the, the court of public opinion always matters, but regardless of what anybody tells you, does that mean the court of public opinion is always determinative? No. But the idea that it's insignificant, inconsequential, you're seeing in live time in these Trump cases, uh, even liberal Democratic courts that I guarantee you hate and despise Donald Trump personally 
are saying, ah, no, we're not willing to go that far. Um, and now, d- does this have an impact on, um, what's her name, Fannie Willis and or Jack Smith? If they're seeing the way these are going in New York and Colorado and Michigan and New Hampshire, wherever it is. Are, well, are Fannie's they- just trying to buy time. And her so-called proffers with lawyers leaked, and there's nothing really. And in fact, it makes her case look weaker rather than better. And she basically just wanted to bring the charges because the trial is not happening until after Election Day, which means who knows what happens after Election Day. But my guess is if Trump was elected, those charges are going to go away in Georgia. So that that was more theater than it was reality. The Florida case, because the federal the, there you have a decent judge. And so she is unwilling to allow those cases to uh, progress in an imp- in an imp- uh, impermissible manner. And so those are getting delayed to probably after Election Day. So they're, they're all of their eggs are really in one basket, and it's the D.C. case. And my guess is that D.C. case's judge's gag order is about is going to be overturned before Christmas Day. And that will be another loss and more egg in the face. Uh, while the Supreme Court is likely to take up some January 6th cases and start to reverse some of the things that have already taken place. So I think that what they're doing is they're setting themselves up for failure uh, and an embarrassing failure. The greatest threat to the president is still the D.C. case. And hopefully somebody steps in and does something to put that case back on the right track. Uh, maybe we go through theater. People ask what happens if you know Trump is jailed. Doesn't matter. Uh, what happens if he wins? Uh, the and, and he's in jail. It'll make the entire federal judicial system look like a joke. And at that point, my guess is uh, these, either the Supreme Court or somebody would step in and set it all aside. The uh, now my hunch is still that Biden's going to do this on the federal charges. To per, if he loses to to cover for his own family, he'll disguise it as a broad political pardon mm. to restore order and help integrity because that's Joe Biden. He likes to bring people together, especially especially over bribes. Then he really likes to bring them together. The uh, 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 even though you know he was running around kissing up to G this past week, asking where that money is, or maybe he'll have to send some more ships to the sea. The uh, but we'll see, uh, but I think we're seeing at least some promise. Uh, while we're still seeing ridiculous actions against the president, against President Trump, we're at least seeing some restraint start to step in by the judicial branches. That okay, maybe we shouldn't go too far. So hopefully that side of the judiciary can uh, continues to show promise, even while uh, Joe Biden uh, is trying to take over the internet in the interim. Okay, now we're going to do this. We're going to head over to Rumble, and I'll give everyone the Viva Barnes link, but I seem to have gotten rid of that live link. Uh, One more time, here's the link to Rumble, people. Uh, Come on over, because we're going to end now. Let's see the number go down, 2872, 2887. That's the wrong direction. Come on over to Okay, and let me just give the the link to the live chat if everybody wants to go for it. On Tuesday, on YouTube and Rumble, I'll be live at 1 p.m. Eastern time with the Durant to discuss the Argentinian election, where it looks like a good right-leaning populist just got elected president, to discuss what the heck's going on in Catalonia and Spain, to discuss Biden and Xi, to discuss the U.S. political perspective on the Israeli-Hamas conflict, what kind of consternation is uh, happening at the State Department and the Biden administration and the intelligence apparatus amongst the ordinary voters. Uh, why Scott Horton needs to go to the nut house for a little while because of how crazy he is about Israel. And he needs to quit lying about Robert Kennedy just because he hates Israel. The, uh, we'll be talking about that and other things uh, on the show on Tuesday, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Community, remind me not to go live Tuesday at 1 o'clock. Okay, we are going to end on YouTube. You all have the links to both Rumble and VivaBarnesLaw.Locals.com. Ending on YouTube in 3, 2, 1. See you all there.